All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, Your Body's Environmental Chemical Burden. This course is approved for one hour in Continuing Education Units, AIBD, um, Nary Green, uh, Certified Green Professional, BPI, Non Whole House, among many, as well as AIA, Health, Welfare, and Safety, um, HSW, which may make it applicable for your state based design or contractor license. Um, my name is Brett Little. I'm the executive director at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute, and I will be uh, your moderator today. And our session is going to be uh, learning more about environmental chemical exposure to um, toxicants and discover resources potentially to avoid future exposure while simultaneously accepting responsibility for the role uh, we all play in doing this. And I want to thank, number one, first, our top tier sponsor for this, uh, Panasonic. Very exciting news here. Uh, they, uh, with their brand new Cosmos system that just came out, uh, was a Green Builder Media Sustainability Award winner of 2020, uh, just announced last week at IBS show. So make sure to check out that whole thing. Um, but this whole idea of the Cosmos system is very exciting. It's smart ventilation technology that runs at really low ventilation, really low energy, and then ramps up to remove pollution uh, in your home, in your client's home, through new builds and uh, wirelessly through retrofits. So how does it work? At the top left there um, is a uh, system that is a smart home system that communicates throughout the home, detecting pollution such as VOCs, particulate matter 2.5, carbon dioxide, and humidity. And then when the pollution uh, is detected, it communicates with uh, the Whisper Green bath fan that you've hopefully installed in one or many of your bathrooms uh, for your clients. Then that uh, exhaust fan ramps up even more uh, to exhaust the pollutants if they're nearby. And then simultaneously, the Whisper Fresh Select, which is a uh, either ducted or separate standalone fan there on the bottom left, starts bringing in more fresh air into the house or multifamily project to exhaust those pollutants. And then also, um, if, if uh, you install the whisper hood there on the bottom right, the system communicates directly with that to then say, well, the pollution is near the kitchen or maybe you're cooking, and then let's exhaust it through the hood range fan that way as well. And that whisper hood goes through different iterations all the way up to, I believe, 390 CFM. So it is a, it is a modulating system. So that's how these are all interconnected, working together to continuously do smart ventilation with your clients which is very exciting we think is the future for ventilation. Now, if you're interested in incorporating either their IntelliBalance for ducted or Whisper Comfort energy recovery or a heat recovery ventilator systems, uh, you can do that eventually with the Cosmos system. That will be there to um, both replace the, the bath fan and the uh, especially the inline fan. So you can do smart ventilation also with the energy savings of the ERVs. So very exciting stuff coming out here. Go to um, Panasonic.com, um, Cosmos Healthy Home System, to learn more about that, and we hope to be doing some sessions on that as well. We also want to thank our second sponsor, Serve um, Smart Ventilation. Now, basically, you're going to take what I just talked about um, there with Panasonic, but you're going to bring it to another level. Um, instead of um, uh, the ERV exchanger core, the serve uses a high efficiency heat pump to exchange energy to become incoming supply and outgoing air. And so that does condition comfortable air that unifies the home instead of dragging the exterior rooms away from comfort. So this serve is also detecting pollution in the air, smart ventilation, it's been around a lot longer, but it has an integrated ER heat pump in it. And it has filter access panel that's really easy to get to um, for both indoor and outdoor air filters and accepts up to MERV 13. So you can learn more about that for smart ventilation over at Build Equinox. All right, well, uh, very excited here um, to have uh, Cindy Clement on. And just real quick, you know, I don't often get to meet all of our speakers all the time in person because it's webinars. And so I was very fortunate uh, to get to actually meet her in person the other week at an awards event and just very thrilled to talk with her and do that. So I, I wanted to put that out there. but. She is an adjunct lecturer for the graduate level course, Functional and Integrative Medicine at Eastern Michigan University. And among her decades long training in holistic, alternative and complementary integrative and functional medicine, she holds a master's degree in nutrition from Eastern Michigan University. The board certified nutritionist and is accredited as a master certified health educator 
um, by the National Commission for Health Education uh, Credentialing. So she is the author of the international best-selling book here, um, Your Body's Environmental Chemical Burden, A Resource Guide to Understanding and Avoiding Toxins. And I have one of those books here in my hand today, and we're gonna be giving it out to one of you lucky attendees, as we often do at our sessions. So stick around for this entire session, and at the end, we'll take a survey of who's here and do a drawing. And if you're here with us, we'll be um, announcing your name, and we'll be sending the book out hopefully tomorrow or Friday. So with that, Cindy, I am going to pass it off to you. And I, again, thank you so much for doing this and joining us. It is absolutely my pleasure. And oh my goodness, after this presentation today, people are all going to want these whisper ventilation systems and this serve ventilation system. So oh my goodness, this is terrific. Um, love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Hold on. I'm on the wrong view here. Let's go to the right one. There we go. Now, does that look good to you, Brett? Do I have the, the column with the questions and answers showing on your screen, or is it okay? Nope, it's just the just your slides, so you're good to go. Okay. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your lunch hour, or maybe if you're on the West Coast, you're having a cup of coffee this morning. But it really is such an honor and a pleasure to work with Green Home Institute on this webinar, because truly my passion is sharing this very important message on the body burden. And I will say this might not be the most uplifting webinar that you've ever attended, but the information I'm presenting, it's real. And, and this is, this, I'm going to arm you with information that helps you safeguard yourself, safeguard the people that you're building for and designing for, as well as ways to help our planet, which is in such a mess. And Brett did a great job, um, you know, recommend, or I actually did, uh, introducing who I am, so we won't spend much time other than just visit my website when we're finished with the webinar or when you get a moment, because I have a lot of educational information there, as well as little clips um, from what is in that book. Also, links to my social media, because some of this information can be a little overwhelming to learn. So if you follow me on social media, you'll get a little tip every day, something that you can implement in your life, in your work, that can help to make it a little bit safer. Now, how this all came about was in the fall of uh, 2013, I had attended a lecture and heard the term body burden. And it wasn't discussed back then what this was as um, important it is, as it is today. And I walked away from that webinar wondering, now is this burden that they're talking about, this body burden, is this an emotional burden that people are carrying? Or is this all this excess body weight that people carry? And, and I wasn't quite sure. So one day when I had time, I logged into the uh, Eastern Michigan Library online, and I just typed the words body burden, and much to my surprise, over 420,000 research papers were immediately at my fingertips. And so I had to narrow it down because that was overwhelming. And in the previous three years, there were still 123,000 research papers. Now today, I can tell you that over 50 thousand studies are conducted annually on this body burden. So I have the results and I start skimming the, the names of these journals where these articles are printed. And I began to realize that this was an environmental cause, that our body burden was something coming through to us through that environment. And as I read some of this research, I became increasingly alarmed at what might be it lurking about inside my body. So I contacted my physician, and told him I wanted to do a body burden test. And he told me if I could find one, he'd be glad to see what he could do to get me into the study. But what I found is that what they do in research is they test the fat because the adipose fat is actually the most re reliable approach to determining one's body burden. But if you wanted to do it personally on your own, the only thing I could find was a test by Genova Diagnostics 
called the toxic core effects uh, test, and it tested for 43 of the most common chemicals that a person is exposed to today. Now, at the time I was 60 years old, I'm now 67, but at the time I was 60. Now, folks, I had beating, been eating organic since the 1970s, the late 1970s. I had been using the best personal care products, the best cleaning products for four decades. So when I saw the results of this toxicology testing, I was startled. If you look at these percentiles, now remember that means the 95th percentile means that out of 100 people, only five people had more of this chemical in their body than did I. So I became obsessed. I had to find out where were these chemicals coming from. And for the next nine months, I accumulated over 1,500 clinical studies. And you're looking at a, a this image, you're looking at the pile on my desk of some of the notes from those 1,500 studies that I read. And I read these studies and I highlighted the important parts to make those notes. And at the time, I had been lecturing quite extensively across the United States. So most of this reading was done in airports and airplanes and hotels. But as I went through this material, I learned what these chemicals are used for. I learned how many trillions and billions of pounds of these chemicals are produced worldwide. And I came to understand how we are exposed and those potential health effects that can occur. occur. And as this was all happening, reading these papers, I became extremely concerned about the millennial generation and the hardships that they're going to face from exposure to this toxic environment. Now, the World Health Organization estimates that environmental factors contribute to 13% of the deaths worldwide, and yet this environmental contribution of these toxins is rarely mentioned in initiatives to combat disease. Dr. Judith Stern at the University of California, Davis, has this great analogy. She says that our genes load the gun, but our environment is what pulls the trigger and kind of turns those, those DNA, damaged DNA on. So not just environmental chemicals, but things like how much sleep do we get? What is our diet like? Do we ex exercise? Do, do, do we have high amounts of stress in our lives? So there's much to consider. Now, as I went through the research, I began to see that most of the studies were focusing on just one single chemical at a time, but rarely are we exposed to just one chemical. And that concerns in the scientific community. They're mounting because these different chemicals have the ability to enhance the toxicity and intensify the effects of the other chemicals that aren't in that study. And so in the end, the challenge then is to determine the multiple sources that a person has been exposed to, multiple classes, multiple concentrations, and this is not an easy fix. And on top of that, we also have to consider why one person might react to a chemical and another not. Because you see, the different chemicals have different health effects. And when we are exposed to multiple chemicals on this daily basis, it does result in a type of slurry in our bodies. And that slurry has this additive and synergistic effects with these other chemicals. So these complications to research what is the health of that person's detoxification you know, uh, organs in their body, such as the liver? What does their DNA look like? And really, very importantly, what was the level of exposure, the duration, how often, and most importantly, the timing of that dosage? Over, a ten, uh, over 10 years ago, there were studies conducted on newborn cord blood. Now, this is 10 years ago. And on average, they found 
287 chemicals being passed on to the developing baby from the mother. And the studies of breast milk and meconium, which is that first kind of that black sticky stool that an infant passage, that too showed the passage of these chemicals. Because see, the problem is, as many of these chemicals in our environment are resisting elimination. So they persist in our bodies. And then these number of compounds that we're exposed to that are being stored in our body over long periods of time start to produce these ill effects. And what some of the researchers are saying is that the impact of this environmental exposure won't be realized yet for many years, and that some changes in our DNA may extend beyond the generation being exposed. In other words, these young infants that are developing now, these changes may affect future generations as well. So the pediatric academic societies have actually affirmed that the functioning of, functioning of this current generation can even be impacted by a low level exposure. Now think about that. When I was born in 1953, there weren't a lot of chemicals. We lived in the middle of the country. The groundwater wasn't contaminated yet. We lived in the country, the air was clean. The foods didn't have as many chemicals added to them or pesticides. So when I was in the womb, my mother didn't pass these chemicals on to me. Maybe a little bit of DTE or DDE or DDT, but certainly not what these children are getting today, not 287 toxicants. So I'm not over the threshold, but when a baby is coming in with that many chemicals already in their tissue, they can be impacted by even a low level exposure. So meanwhile, in Spain, they have this amazing program going on. It's called the Helix Pro uh, Project. And they're looking at prenatal exposure in these infants through their developing years. And what they mean by that is through adolescence. Because the goal of this project is to better understand how this chemical exposure is going to influence future disease. In other words, how it's going to pull that trigger on the DNA. So this human early life exposome project says all of these things that you're looking at on that slide, all of these things are contributing to a child's body burden. And as you look at the things in bold, you're going to see that a lot of that has to do with the building industry. So today, I just want to focus a little bit on something called an endocrine disruptor. So think of endocrine as just hormones in the body. So a hormone disruptor. And what they do is the chemicals that have this endocrine or hormone disrupting potential, what it does is it mimics natural hormones in the body. So, so for instance, these different um, molecules can then from these chemicals that we're exposed to, they can alter the normal hormonal balances in both men and women. They can lead to infertility. They can lead to early adolescence in young girls and delayed adolescence in our young boys. They can also disrupt the normal metabolic processes that we develop early in our life and increase our susceptibility to weight gain across the lifespan. These chemicals can also affect our thyroid, our, our glucose and insulin. So think diabetes or prediabetes, and they can in increase our risk of, of cardiovascular disease. So the World Health Organization now lists about 800 chemicals that are capable of interfering with our hormone receptor sites. And in 2013, the National Institutes of Health came out and stated that these chemicals are absolutely associated uh, with obesity. So we've got chemicals that are interfering with our bodies and our hormone development. 
In 2012, the United Nations Environmental uh, Program, along with the World Health Organization, they update every 10 years, they update a document and they updated their endocrine disrupting chemical project in 2012. And in this edition, they listed concerns about these chemicals regarding the health of humans and wildlife. And in this document, they talked about how 40% of the men in certain countries have low semen qualities and that penile malformations have increased over time in baby boys as have non-descending testicles. And that uh, uh, I'm sorry, hold on. And that females, uh, uh, they, they are increasing diseases in their reproductive organs and in their thyroids. And that it's, we also have prostate cancer and testicular cancer and diabetes rapidly increasing. So out of these tens of thousands of synthetic chemicals that are manufactured to create vinyl flooring and to create fabrics and, and carpets and wallpapers, over the past five decades, little toxicology information is existing on these chemicals and in defense. It is ethically not possible to expose human beings to these chemicals for research. So there's another complication. In 1976, the Centers for Disease Controls, their Toxic Substances Control Act, grandfathered in 60,000 chemicals, which did not have the safety information, uh, the, the safety ratings on them yet. They just grandfathered them in. And yet 34 years later, 17,000 of those chemicals were still in use, some with questionable safety ratings. So meanwhile, the goal of the Stockholm Convention on what they call persistent organic pollutants, they want to restrict and eliminate the use of 23 chemical classes. These, these, these reduction policies in the U.S. are being met with a lot of resistance. So we have some work to do. We have to educate people that can make a change. And of course, that's going to be in that building industry. Because you see, environmental medicine is in its infancy right now. Many of the clinicians are not aware of the science behind this toxicant bioaccumulation, nor are they aware of the related health consequences. So let's take sick building syndrome, for instance. The effects of, of sick building, or what we call it in, in environmental medicine is building related illness is what we call it. The effects can be localized in a particular room or zone, or they can be widespread throughout the building. And this building-related illness can be attributed directly to the airborne contaminants in the building. In fact, the World Health Organization in February of just 2016 said that exposure to household air pollution leads to almost 4 million premature deaths every year from stroke, lung cancer, and something called COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, if we think household exposure, that is an indoor exposure. So we have to consider what's going on. So let's take a look at that indoor environment. Thanks for watching. Please continue to watch the next part of the session to complete the course and get your continuing education credits. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.